Well, we're continuing with our study of Paul's second letter to Timothy. We call it 2 Timothy. We're in the first chapter, and we're just kind of beginning to get into the depth of it, into the instructions to Timothy. And when we last left Paul talking to Timothy, he said, I remember this, I remember this, I remember this. Now, let me remind you of a couple of things. And to just fan that, that flame of that, the use of your gift that God is doing in you, Timothy, don't forget to do that. And again, we're reminded of Paul's suffering. He's in a Roman prison. If he is in the Mamertine prison, we think that he's two levels below ground. It's cold, it's dark, it's damp. And it's really that setting that I want to begin today. And I want to talk about suffering. In this lesson, he's going to talk about gospel suffering. But let's just think about this whole notion of what suffering means. We end up looking at suffering in a variety of different ways. Sometimes we say, well, I'm suffering because I have a cold, or I don't feel well today. Or, you know, the people that I have I've met here in Russia, some of you are going through incredible suffering times. I've met, uh, I've heard stories of people who can't have enough money to live, who don't have enough money for food. Uh, it's almost time for school to begin in a short time. You don't have enough money for books. That's suffering. Uh, you can look at the weather, and it's hot every day, and you say, my, my apartment is so hot. It never cools off at night. I'm suffering because it's so hot. Or in winter, when it's below zero, you say, I'm suffering because it's cold. So a lot of times, our suffering ends up centering on our circumstances, what's happening to us. If anyone had a chance to complain about his circumstances and his suffering, it would be the Apostle Paul. But the interesting thing that he does when he talks about his suffering is he actually ends up rejoicing in it. That he, cause, he, he, he ends up thinking that it is an honor to suffer for the gospel of Jesus Christ. His circumstances are awful. They are difficult. They are terrible. He's going to die. What we know from tradition, or what we think from tradition, is that Paul was lifted out of that prison. He was led out along a road. He was asked to kneel down, and they took a sword or an axe and they chopped off his head. That's suffering. He didn't suffer because he was intelligent. He didn't suffer because he was rich. He wasn't rich. He suffered for one thing only, and that was the gospel of Jesus Christ. So when he writes this particular section to his friend Timothy in Ephesus, he says, Timothy, I know it's not easy. I know that false teaching is in these churches. I know what kind of gifts God has given you, but you must suffer with rejoicing because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. One of the things that makes this topic so difficult in this current age in which we live is we have tried to remove suffering from the gospel, and we've tried to separate them. We, we, have, we have preachers and teachers in America who would say, you know, God wants to bless you. God wants you to be happy. God wants you to be fulfilled. And in essence, they're saying you shouldn't have to suffer. That if you just have a good attitude, life will be good. God will provide for you financially, and you don't need to suffer. And what's happened, instead of having a cross-centered or a gospel-centered theology, especially in the Western world, we have developed a me-centered gospel. It's a gospel that says it's about me, that if I will work hard enough, God will reward me. That if I have a positive attitude, God will help me. That if I work this amount of hours or if I do this particular kind of job, then God will bless me. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to Timothy, says, Timothy, and he doesn't use these exact words, my paraphrase, it's not about you, Timothy. It's about the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's about the health of these churches. It's about being a model, an example, and a testimony to the grace and the gospel of Jesus Christ. What you're seeing here is gospel-oriented suffering. Timothy certainly is suffering for the gospel. He's trying to be a faithful teacher. He's trying to lead these people in a gospel-oriented way, but it's so hard. And he simply needs Paul to come along and say, Timothy, continue on, persevere. So today we're going to look at 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 through 14. 
the next section in this letter, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 through 14. This is what it says. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, or of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and apostle and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. There's really two sections in which this this, uh, number of verses breaks down into. And the first section is in verses 8 through 12. We call it a call to courage. In the face of suffering, Timothy, you must have courage. Now, this is just a little side additional note, but verses 8 through 12 in the original language is just one sentence. One of the things that Paul does when he writes is sometimes he'll just keep adding one idea onto another, onto another, onto another, and he gets these very long sentences. Verses 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12 is one sentence. If you were doing this in a a class, for your professor, you'd say, please shorten your sentences, get smaller, more concise ideas. But Paul, his thought takes him here, it takes him here, it takes him here, it takes him here, and it all connects in one sentence in this section of verses 8 through 12. See, what Timothy is falling prey to is to be ashamed of the gospel. In verse 8, it says, therefore, we, we tell our people, whenever you see the word therefore, we say you're supposed to ask, what is it there for? What it does is it connects the previous uh, lesson or the previous section of verses. He had just gotten done telling Timothy, Timothy, let me remind you, fan into flame the gift that God has given you. You remember the heritage you have, what your mother and your grandmother have poured into you. God wants you to have a spirit of power and of love and self-control. Therefore, Timothy, since this is what God wants for you, since this is what God wants of you, don't be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Don't be ashamed about the testimony of the Lord. When I was a young boy, maybe third or fourth grade, I was very bold in my witness for the Lord. I remember being out on the playground after school with two of my Christian friends and two or three of the non-believer friends. And I remember trying to argue with them about the gospel of Jesus Christ and that somehow if they would just listen and if they would just believe that that, that they would understand and they would have what I have. And I don't know what happened between grades four and the rest of my life, but all of a sudden, when you get into high school and peer pressure or into college or university, you start to realize that there are more people who disagree with you than agree with you. And as a child, and you have this innocence, and you have this boldness, you say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'll say anything, anywhere, anytime. But something changes, and it changed in me. I wasn't ashamed of the gospel, but all of a sudden, I had this fear. I can't say that. I I, I don't have the courage to say that. Paul says, Timothy, don't be ashamed about the testimony about our Lord. He's the one who's given you life. He's the one who's given you purpose. He's the one who's given you meaning. But Timothy, there's something else I don't want you to be ashamed of. Don't be ashamed of me, his prisoner. You know, sometimes it's fun to be friends with the popular people in school. I don't know who your groups of friends are, or your, whether they're adults or in the university or whether you're students. Say, boy, I, if I could only be her friend, if I could only be his friend, then, then, then I, would, I would feel special, I would feel significant. And so you become their friend, and you become best friends, and you just enjoy being with them. And part of the fun of being with them is that everybody likes them. They're very popular. 
If they're a young lady, maybe they're beautiful or they're particularly talented. Everybody looks at them and says, oh, they're so beautiful. They're so smart. They're so fun to be with. And because you're with them, it makes you feel better. Or maybe if you're a young man, that person is particularly strong or he's particularly athletic. Or maybe he's particularly intelligent or he's very popular. Say, oh, if I could be his friend. And so you become his friend and you feel good because everybody likes them. And then something happens and they're not so popular and you realize, I don't want to be their friend anymore because nobody likes them. That means nobody likes me. Even a small contribution can make a big difference. Jesus fed over 5,000 people because of a little boy's five loaves. Regardless of the amount, your contribution is very important and greatly appreciated. Visit us at www.tvseminary.com. I have certain sports teams that I really enjoy, a baseball team, a football team. That, that I'm, I am a big fan. I, they, I, they are my favorite teams. I really enjoy it when they're number one. I have a hard time when they're the worst. Paul is now at his worst. There were big crowds and big churches and big followings before when Paul was traveling around. So now he sits in this prison and it's embarrassing. And so he has to tell Timothy, don't be ashamed of me, Timothy. God's not ashamed of me. He says, but rather than being ashamed of me, he says, I want you to share in my suffering. And you are. You're struggling in these churches. You're, you're trying to understand the, the power of the gospel in the life of these churches, but share in my suffering. Why? For the gospel by the power of God. Timothy, what we're both doing is for the gospel. You're teaching, you're working in churches for the gospel. I've done what I've done. I'm sitting in this prison for the gospel and by the power of God. Timothy, we can do it, not in our own strength, but in the power that he gives. Timothy, don't be ashamed of me. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever had someone who used to be your friend, and now when they see you, they turn and look the other way? That every time they see you, they're ashamed to say that they knew you, and they don't even admit to knowing you. They found another group of friends, or they've got another following, and they say, I don't want to be around. That hurts at the deepest core. But what Paul is saying, I'm sitting in this prison, Timothy. Don't be ashamed of me. We're both suffering. We're both suffering for the cause of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He continues his sentence by explaining the power of God. It says, who saved us, who called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose. Timothy, it wasn't anything that we did. But God in his sovereignty, God in his power, God in his control had a special calling. He had a special purpose. He had a special grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. Timothy, the plan that God has implementing right now here in the first century, God knew that centuries ago. I want you to think about that in the ministry context in which you are right now. The fact that you are here or the fact that you're watching or listening is not an accident. It's all part of God's plan. He didn't just think about it yesterday. He didn't think about it a week ago. He didn't think about it a hundred years ago. God knew centuries ago, before the world was ever formed, that you would be sitting in this class or that you would be watching this video. He knew that. He called you to a special purpose. His own purpose, his grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, he continues the thought in verse 10, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death, who brought life, who brought immortality to light through the gospel. Jesus Christ, Timothy. It's all about Jesus Christ. Imagine how, t uh, how Paul's thoughts about Jesus Christ have changed over the years. He used to be a persecutor of the followers of Christ. As we said in a previous lesson, we don't think that Paul ever met Jesus while he was on earth. But the things that Paul did to try to root out these new followers of Christianity, of the way, how he hated those followers, how he tried to destroy them. 
and to come all the way around in repentance and life to say, this Jesus Christ, he abolished death, he brought life, he brought immortality, he brought it to light through the gospel. I, I bet I've already said it 30 times in all of the lessons. It's always about the gospel. There's another phrase that I did, haven't said now for a couple of lessons that fits here well too. Belief drives behavior. Belief drives behavior. That what we believe determines how we're going to live. Timothy, if you believe that the gospel is central to finding life, to finding meaning, to find purpose, it's going to affect the way you live. You're not going to be embarrassed. You're not going to be ashamed. But you're going to live in the power and the grace that God gives you. He's the one who gives life and light and immortality. He continues his thought. His long sentence is still not done. In verse 11, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher. Verse 12, which is why I suffer as I do. Timothy, I didn't choose to do what I do. He chose me. He called me. He asked me to do that. And I do it willingly. I'm sitting here in this prison. The light is dim. The walls are damp. It's cold. I'm thinking about you. I, I'm praying for you. Tears come into my eyes when I think about you. If there was ever an opportunity for me to come visit you once more and again, I would do it so fast, Timothy. I would be there, but I can't come right now. I think that I'm coming to the end of my life. But Timothy, I want you to identify with Jesus Christ. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10-11 How to give to TVS Ministry You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.